Hello, everyone. I'm Heather. And I'm Sean the Book Maniac. <laughs> uh, and this is the Soggy Expat Book Maniac Tag. Welcome. <laughs> We are doing this by Zoom. It's an original tag that we have co-created. I'm dialing in from Tokyo. And where the hell are you, Heather? Wales. Yeah. Cardiff. Heather is one of the most fabulous booktubers out there. And you need to go check out her channel because she's, she's fabulous. Oh, same, so we, babes. You're just being, you're just flattering. I'm flattering. We came up with an original tag, which is mostly just goofy conversational tags. And we decided to name it after our a hybrid of our channel names. And we do have prompts to go with those four words from the her two channel names. And the rest of them are just kind of random stuff. And Heather's going to get us started. Okay. Right. Soggy. I know this seems like no big deal. Okay. But it's a huge deal for me. It tells me your whole personality, your answer to this question. Okay. First question, cold, soggy fries, yay or nay, okay? Like you've got the fries, <clears throat> you've got the hot meal, okay? You've eaten your fill, and uh, there's leftovers. You push them to the side, you're full now, you don't want that anymore. You go out, you go drinking, you have a nice time. You come home, those fries, bin or face? That's the question I'm looking for, okay? And for me, it's obviously face. You know, there's no bad fries. Like, I will also dip that in literally anything. A milkshake, you know, mayonnaise, ketchup, curry sauce, leftover spaghetti. That is all fair game as About a soggy well, fries fair, but... menu. <laughs> but you, babe, like what? Is soggy fries, your name? I think if I'm really hungover, that would actually sounds appealing. But otherwise, no, because I I, no. I I don't let fries go cold. I wolf them down. I inhale oh. them. So. Okay, this is this is a whole other thing. Yeah, definitely. Are you a person who even makes soggy fries exist? That's you know, right. that's a whole nother that's a whole nother zone. You're right. Like, like cold pizza. What the hell? I eat it all. Mm. It gets cold. <laughs> I feel I feel you on this. Yeah, I can respect that. I can respect that. But I'm sure that I, you know, you you. you Go to throw the McDonald's bag out the next morning and there's a few fries in the bottom. I probably wouldn't let them go to waste. Like, you know, there are starving children. Like, why would you throw it away, though? It's a deeply philosophical <laughs> prompt, and I'm so glad you brought it to book two. <laughs> Thanks. The next prompt is expat. And the question is fairly obvious. Have you ever lived abroad? Would you? Heather. I have done. Yes. Mm. I'm an American and I live in Wales. I moved here when I was 22 and I had no idea what it would even entail. But it, it's been a banger. It's been a good time. Like uh, American Heather, like Heather who's only American, would never have thought just like a liquid lunch in work time would be acceptable. But Welsh Heather feels like how can you work without it? There you yeah. go. So uh, what is your uh, liquid lunch consist of while we're while we're on the topic? This is a, a light sprinkle of vodka, light, and the rest is soda. It hydrates you while you're drinking. It's brilliant, really. It's, it's my go-to drink. And also, it makes it so that it's just a light buzz for emails. Just a light buzz. Or booktube tags. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What about you? You obviously, you obviously also. I am a Canadian an living in Tokyo. I've been here for 13 years and I'm only here for another few more weeks before I move back to Canada. So I'm <sighs> going to be done with expatriate life. I know. I saw your book haul. Getting rid of all your stuff. Yeah, well, look at these shelves. They're empty. Yeah, they are empty. I've enjoyed it immensely. It's been a great place. It's a great experience. And I am so ready to be done with it. I'm done with Japan. It's not like I'm sick of Japan. I kind of pretend that I'm sick of it. There are some things about living here that drive me crazy. Are, are, don't you have those? Like, do you still have culture shock? I don't know how many years you've been in Wales. You, you will inadvertently be revealing your age if you tell us, because you said how old you were when you got here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been here 11 years, or I guess oh. like 11 or 12, roughly. Yeah, loads. But I still do have like culture shock every once in a while. Yeah. Like usually it's like in a weird place. You're not expecting it. 
you know, like uh, like schools, like with my kid in school. Like she'll sort of say something about school and I'll be like, you've done that in school, you know, like that. What about you? Like what's like a weird thing? Oh, so much. I, I get, I'm so, you know, it's also because I've moved into late middle age living here. So I'm a cranky old guy and mm-hmm. things just drive me crazy about this. And there's so many things I'm looking forward to not having to deal with one of my biggest pet peeves and this is not a pet peeve tag but so just very briefly is bicycles on the sidewalk it drives me fucking crazy oh my god do you have a lot of it in japan on the sidewalk oh that's where the bicycles all are <gasps> yes. i expect you to move and a dozen people a year get killed in pedestrian bicycle accidents in this country because oh my god. they're maniacs so anyway, yes, a lot of, and so many things I'm looking forward to about Canada that I can't get here. You know, red skin potatoes. Ooh. What's your it, it's going to be like, just like more relaxing too, isn't it? Like, oh, what? Yes. like countryside. Going the, I'm going from the most manic, mm. busiest, largest metropolitan center in, on earth to probably mm. one of the quietest, quietest and sleepiest. <laughs> <sighs> Amazing. Look forward to that. So yes, expat. What is the next prompt that you have? Okay, number three, book a trip you took or would like to take because of a book or author or a, a book or author made you want to see it in person. I feel like this is me just selfish, really, like um trying to get other people's like ideas of where they want to go for books so that I can like write them down. What about you? What have you got? I didn't think of this one yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 um. I guess the best answer is that I, I've got literally three weeks left in Japan and I still haven't done a trip that I've wanted to take ever since I came here, which is to walk around all the places mentioned in Haruki Murakami's novel, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle, or even Ichiku Hachiyan, IQ84, because the <laughs> both of those are set in Tokyo. And when I read wind up her chronicle i hadn't ever been to japan and and you know so to, to reread it and visit all those places i never did it and i know that i won't do it so my answer is maybe none but in terms of the future um visiting writers homes and stuff museums great like barbara pym if there was a barbara pym museum in somewhere in the uk i would love to visit it or something but i'm gonna google it <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there is because I, I would probably know. Look. But that, my answer is half assed. It's, right, it's good. It's good. That is good about 1Q84. I did love that one. Yeah. And I did like follow their trails from like a, you know, Google Maps. Sure. Oh, I love you know? doing I'd that. Love, I'd love I to do that. I love doing that. I, I'm um, doing with the uh, Welsh novel I'm reading right now. What's his name? Richard Owen Roberts. Hello, friend. We missed you. Oh and yeah! All of the place names, and it's on the. I, I finally figured out because it's not really obvious, or I maybe I missed some cues that it's set on the island of Anglesey. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm following all of that, and I'm really having a good time. That's more my thing than actually going and visiting a place. But yeah. I, I, I get why some people are really into that. Oh, Anglesey's so, lush. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Oh. Huh. So where would you want to go, or? have gone okay so i have been stalking these places for quite a while in my life um i think the most recent one is cornwall to do with like uh, daphne du maurier and like my deep obsession with her oh. and everything to do with her oh, i oh, like oh. forced my whole family to go there like they were like what's in cornwall for us to do and i was like stop talking come <laughs> Now that is fascinating because I don't I don't have that obsession with her. She's interesting to me, but not I'm not obsessed. But I remember there was a little bit about Cornwall in the Wolf Hall, one of the Wolf Hall books by Hilary Mantel. Yeah. Historically, that uh, didn't Henry VIII have to put down a rebellion in Cornwall? And apparently, oh, yeah. Cornwall has kind of been a badass part of the of the British Isles. Of, uh, since time immemorial and i'm really interested in the culture and i've read other books that have been set there and so i would come with you to cornwall oh my god cornwall's so amazing it's so cool and like their language is related to welsh it's like a it's like a cousin That's so right. as a welsh speaker we can like go there 
And like all the signs and everything are also in Cornish. And it's like mutually intelligible, the two. And it's it's weird. It's like, why? Why is it like that? It blows your mind. Cornish game hen. <laughs> I've had them a couple times in my childhood. I remember my aunt got married in 1976. And that was what was served at the wedding banquet. Cornish game hen in Canada. Right. In Canada. But I've never seen it on a menu or had it ever since then. And now as a gay man, you know, Cornish game, <laughs> Cornish game hand, Cornish game hand, Cornish game hand. <laughs> uh, number four, another book prompt, a book or writer from Canada and or Wales you'd like to read. For Wales, I'm interested in Welsh literature and am not widely read. Probably the next one that I would like to read is a very newly published anthology of queer writing from Wales. I think I might have heard of this. I think um, I follow a couple of like queer bookstores in Cardiff, and I think I might have heard of this. Queer Square Mile, queer short stories from Wales, and it's edited by Kirsty Bohata. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe, I think I've heard of this one. Maybe some other editors. I can't read the, the, the print's too small. And I actually had attended the book launch on Zoom the other day. Really? Yeah. Well, that's right. What, the authors were there, were they? And they had like, uh, two, a, like two, a chat. two or three of them were. Two or three of them were. And actually, the audio quality was so bad that the moderator kept. So many people told him, "Keep the mic by your mouth," but he kept putting it down and he couldn't hear anything. So finally, I just logged off. I didn't finish watching it, but it's five hundred pages. Just published. Well, in fact, apparently it doesn't publish until June, according to Goodreads. But uh, I think it's oh, so that's, that's it. mine for Wales. Do you have one for? Wales or Canada that you'd like to read? So I did think of a Canadian one, right? So I'm already sort of quite Margaret Atwood obsessed. Oh. I think most people are in a way. I saw her at Hay Festival and she was just the crankiest and I just want to be her. <laughs> so you are I'd her, like Heather. To... You are her. Oh, thanks, babes. <laughs> it's, it's everything I've ever wanted. <laughs> but like, uh, I'd like to just like completely nail everything of hers like I just want to like go on an odyssey and be like anything that Margaret Atwood has ever written I've read it but then I thought for book two prize I've had to read an Omar el Akkad book I've had to read um what strange paradise like and I'm like on a mute for it I'm like on a gag like I'm not allowed to say if I liked it or not I've heard fantastic. good things it about so it I really want to read it so I really want to read it so I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts what Margaret Atwood would you like most that you haven't yet read? Would you most like to read? So I think I need to start getting more into her short stories because she's like a short story queen, apparently. And I've not read anything. I've only read her novels. I haven't delved into uh, del uh, like you know delved into this. There's like the Stone Mattress one. Do you know that one? I know the title. I haven't read it. Yeah, yeah, and like there's just loads of like uh, collections that she does, and I've not I've not delved at all. So I think that'll be where I start first. My favorite Margaret Atwood is Cat's Eye. Oh, good one. Good one. Like, I think weirdly, mine might be like, what's the one with the girl in prison? Uh, she's like oh, 19th century. Yeah. Alias Grace, is it? Alias Grace. Oh, I think that's my favorite. Like, I quite like, you know, her like Mad Adam series. Like, that one hit me quite hard. But I think in the end, Alias Grace... It's better. It's better. Well, I'm going to have to give up my, my passport. You've read more Margaret Atwood than I have. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm obsessed. <sighs> my first or second date uh, with a previous lover years ago in the 90s, early 90s, was going to a Margaret Atwood reading. We went together. <gasps> oh, my God. I love this story. I and love I, it. I've been to several of her readings over the years. Um, I'm adopted, which is not really that important in, in the grand scheme of things, other than that my birth mother was best friends with Margaret Atwood's best friend at university. They were not besties, but they shared a bestie. So they were acquaintances. So my Girl, so this Margaret is amazing. Atwood, I know. So my, my, so Margaret Atwood knew my birth mother. So. But I'm absolutely floored by this information. You have <laughs> just like gone up a thousand percent in like your literary awesomeness. Like you well, were already quite up here, babes. And then it just, I can't did believe you, it. Did you want my autograph? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've only 
I've only twatting dropped my pen down this hole. Like, <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I think we'll just uh, maybe we'll delete the prompts and just put in all the outtakes. <laughs> It just fell down this hole. It just fell down there, and now it's just, it's just like fucking stick. Oh, that's annoying. That's my favorite pen. That. Oh no. Okay, so number five, it's a random one. Embarrassing parent story time. A time when your parent slash guardian embarrassed you, or a time when you actually were that awful parent. I am very curious to hear your story. Do you want to go first? Do you want? So Should I go first? The best one I have is about my grandma, who was babysitting us when mom and dad were on a you know ten day vacation somewhere, and it was me and my sister, and I might have been about thirteen or something, twelve. My sister was two years younger, and I think I had a friend staying over. The school was the elementary school was going on a field trip to the next biggest town, about a forty five minute drive, because the famous Vienna. Lipizzaner Stallions were on tour through Western Canada. You know about them. I saw them in Vienna. Okay. Well, they're really famous. And they were on a tour. The Lipizzaner. Is that pronunciation right? Lipizzaner? Lipizzaner. Lipizzaner. Okay. So too bad my grandma didn't know you. because Anyway. (laughs) So the night before, grandma cooking us dinner. And we're we're all chatting over dinner. And she said, So are your kids excited about going to see the Lesbian Stallions? (laughs) and that's why i'm gay (laughs) like what she just messed up the the title she just messed up the title or she thought they were lesbian horses (laughs) she i don't think she thought they were lesbian horses but i think that's she got a little mixed up in the pronunciation department (laughs) Oh my god, that's brilliant. <laughs> Mine. Yeah. It like may be too horrific to like put on the video, like or to show anyone to this, okay? It may be too horrific and we can cut it out if potentially, but I feel like I need to say because it comes up in my mind every time I think about like being fully scarred by my dad's embarrassing like stuff. So like he was in the army, right? <sighs> He went in the army in 85 or 86, something like this. And he used to say this all the time. Like, he was aware of it. He used to say, there's something to do with the army. You go into the army in a certain year of your life, okay? And then you come out the other side of the army 20, 30 years later, still in that year. So you've got a lot of people walking around and, like, stuff from the 70s. Because I went in, say, 77, you know, they've come out, you know, early 2000s. And they, as far as they're concerned, their civvies are still 70s. Do you know what I mean? Like... But they don't know anything else. They haven't moved on. So my dad used to joke about it, but it it 100% happened to him as well. He was like cemented in 85. Like he'll never progress beyond this. So I was like, okay. And I was just in my house, just chilling with my mates, right? And he's going running. Like, you know, he's like with it. He was in the army, special forces, you know, he's like muscly, you know, he like runs a lot. And he's in these tiny shorts. I'm like, dad, damn. Okay. Those are too small. These shorts, I don't even want to see them anymore, okay? You need to burn them. They're bad. And he was like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. I'm going running. That's what they do in 85. You know, you wear tiny shorts and you go running, you know, even if you're a dude. So he's just wearing these tiny shorts. I'm like, whatever, you know, like you're a mild embarrassment to me, but you feed me. So whatever. So then he starts (laughs) stretching, right? Oh. He starts stretching. I'm getting scared now. (laughs) Me and my friend Christina, okay, just hanging out, minding our own business, watching Hanging MTV. out, I think is the relevant term here. One of his nuggets falls out the side, okay? I don't want to talk about it anymore beyond this point. But he's like, oh, my nuggets. And he just popped him back in. And then he went running. I still, like, I still have, I can't even, don't look at me. <laughs> I think I screamed like a bloody murder scream. Like, <laughs> and my friend Christina, I think she's blocked it from her mind. If I was to ask her about it now, she'd be like, well, you know, I think that her mind erased it for her own sanity. Just, no. So did you say to your dad, dad, testy, testy, testy? Like, I, I, I don't think I said words. I think it was uh, like uh, Christ came into my body and came out his tongues like, ah! 
like that <laughs> is my only response to the nugget falling out the sack. <clears throat> That's all I got. That's all I got. Uh, we're not editing that out. That's price. <laughs> Is your dad a reader? Yeah, yeah. Does he like Balzac? <laughs> Probably not, you know, because he's French, but Balzac he's into. <laughs> oh, my God. That's fantastic. Uh, number six, maniac. What are two things you are a maniac about, aside from OBS being a book maniac? How about you, Heather? So I'm like a maniac about loads of like really nerdy stuff. But at the minute, because it's Eurovision month, Uh I'm hugely intense about the Eurovision. Oh my God, I'm so obsessed. Like, I don't even know what it is. Like, I'd never seen it until I moved to Wales, (laughs) you know, like 11, 12 years ago, whatever. But ever since then, it has taken over all of my life and my dreams and my joys. Like, do you know, like, you know the Eurovision, didn't you? You know the Eurovision. I know about it, and it's, you know, not, not, never followed it very much, but I do know about it, yeah. Oh, my God. It's just the effing greatest thing that's ever been given to man. Like, it's just a bunch of awful singing, awful singing, like, awful outfits, camp outfits, but, like, the way that each different country chooses to present their campy silliness it's just the greatest. It's just the greatest thing. And I start following them from when they start coming out, like January, they start releasing them. Like the UK's one this year is so good. Okay. And it's a shame that like the UK government as a whole has fucked everyone off in Europe by like cutting out with the European Union. So now they hate this and they will never vote us forward. And it's a shame because this guy is awesome. Have you seen him? He's like a TikTok star. At some point, you need to Google him because he looks like Fabio, but with a better beard. Sam Ryder. Sam Ryder. Sam Ryder. He's just, he's just a glorious man. I want to know what shampoo he uses because it just, it just fluffs. I can't do you know? that. So. <laughs> he's so good. And the song, so good. Anyway. I'm just a Eurovision super fan. Also, they have an American version going at the minute, which is like the American song contest or whatever. It's like got Kelly Clarkson and Snoop are hosting it. And like each state is represented. And Washington State's one is effing Alan Stone, who is like the pimp master. If you've never had sex to the dulcet sounds of Alan Stone, have you even had sex? Well, um, I will get back to you on that. (laughs) Now, I'm curious, for Eurovision, um, for the UK, is it only one entrant, or does Scotland get one and Wales get one? And So, huge, you know, argument about this, huge controversy, it's one, just one. They're not allowed to split them up, because um, the EBU, like the European Broadcasting Union, whatever, only one broadcasting thing for each country can be represented, so it's the BBC is the UK's one, and only one of the bits can represent the BBC. But in junior Eurovision, England fucked off last year or like two years ago or whatever. England was like, we're not doing it. And Wales was like, we're going to take the BBC slot. We're literally going to be Wales in Eurovision. And they got really high. Like Wales on their own got to like third in junior Eurovision. (sighs) And now it's like a huge controversy. Like, okay, the UK brand is shot because of Brexit. Like, you've messed it up by voting for something stupid. Now, is it best cut them in chunks and throw them out into the world separately? Sink or swim? Why not? I, I, I'm, I'm all against, I'm all in favor of, what is that called? De- decentralization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Local government, local Eurovision. Girl. Three whales. Yeah. So. What about you, babes? What have you got? Um, What's your obsessive thing? I, I, I'm not going to talk about the royal family. But <laughs> why not? I'm really, I'm really into the royal family, but but I'm gonna kind of broaden it out. I am a news junkie. Like I, as much reading as I do in a day, which is several hours a day, I also spend at least that amount of time listening to and reading the news. Shit, and I yeah, always mom. have. Does One it make you my... crazy? Does it make you really anxious? No. 
uh, although like today Roe v. Wade is probably going out the door and I've been all caught up in that and I've had lots of emotions about it as I'm sure you have and everybody has. I mean, it's just fucked. Yeah. But um, yeah. I just want to be there and follow every live breaking news. Like I'm just all over it. I always have been. I remember one of my favorite memories of my dad is he's a farmer, small rare prairie Saskatchewan. And I, one of my jobs when I was 14 years old was go drive out. I could drive the car. It was illegal, but I would drive out just into the field to pick up dad for dinner, drive back to the house for dinner. And uh, I was listening to the, to the news and there was this breaking news. And so dad got in the truck and I said, oh, did you hear that Andrew Young resigned? And my father said, this, you know, this Canadian, right? I'm Canadian, Saskatchewan, Canada. This is about 1980. I don't know what it was, two or 81 or something. And he said, who's Andrew Young? He was the United Nations. Uh, he was the American ambassador to the United Nations. He was the UN ambassador. Pro prominent uh, black civil rights activist. And there was a scandal, and I don't remember the scandal, but finally he resigned, and my dad had no idea who he was. So that's how much of a news junkie I have always been. One of another thing I'm maniacal about is the news. Oh, that's really hot. Like, um, if like something pops, do you like follow it down rabbit holes? Like, too much information is not enough, and you've just got to like explore the shit out of it. Absolutely, and so the Twitter's good for that, and so is YouTube. When I'm eating dinner, I'm usually watching uh, if, if there's nothing good on booktube if heather doesn't have a new video out i will <laughs> i will browse and watch like raw news footage you know where there's they don't condense it it's the 40 minute yeah. take of a white house press conference or something and I, I, yeah 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 no no oh just... that's that's my favorite kind of people nowadays i get so annoyed by people who think they're informed by memes I just think, like, anyone who's willing to just chase that story down to the ground, like, that's solid people, you know? I want it all in granular detail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one is random one. Have you ever been hideously lost? Literally or figuratively? Well, I won't talk about figurative because we don't have time for that. But <laughs> literally, yes. And it was about 10 years ago. It was the same year... It was the year of the big earthquake in Japan, which I think was about 10 or 11 years ago. Mm. And I was quite traumatized, as was everybody else in the country at that time, by that. And then about a month or so later was there at Japan's annual cherry blossom rituals. So the cherry blossoms bloom in early March or mid-March. Mid and then the tradition is, well, I learned it before I came to Japan as... As they are starting to, just before they fall, everybody has picnics in the park, gets drunk and has sex. But I've never seen anybody have sex at a, at a cherry blossom party. That's Saka, a shame. Japanese, it is a shame. And I tried to change it, but it <laughs> didn't hmm. work out. But I was invited to one. Hmm. And it was the same month or the same year of the big earthquake. And I didn't know any of the people except for the two people that had invited me. And there was about 40 or 50 or maybe even 100 Japanese people. And I was the only white guy I was the only foreigner everybody was so nice to me and I can especially 10 years ago I could drink a lot I can't drink nearly as much as that now but I I, I could drink a lot but I have never been very good at mixing my drinks and I was offered I drink whiskey I drink Japanese sake I drink beer I drink wine I drink absolutely everything going and it was a Sunday night I had to work the next day Oh. So I left early. I left and it was outdoors in the park on a Sunday night and it was dark, but I knew the way home, I thought. <laughs> and I think it was maybe a 25 minute walk to my apartment from this park. And it took me, I would say about three hours because I got lost. I didn't know where I was. And even I was too drunk to, to, to be able to work the GPS. And I was phoning people and saying, I don't know where I am. Can you help me? Actually, I was going on to gay dating apps and asking random people I'm, where am i can you come get me oh did they God. respond did they say yeah oh, turn left. no they didn't they were very unhelpful <laughs> oh my god so, i think if somebody like went on tinder and like talked to one of my mates like like grant or whatever while they're in a club they'd just be like yeah turn here on the corner i'll meet you <laughs> And I, and I finally got halfway home and realized I left my bag. It's, it's all my work stuff and my everything, chargers and you name it. I had everything. I left the bag at the fucking party. So 
And it just it was just a mess. It was just the messiest drunk night of my life. And I got horribly lo- lost. And then the next morning I overslept. Oh, and I also gave updates on Facebook every five minutes. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> I don't know where I am. I love Japan, <laughs> but I don't know where I am in Japan. And, oh, my God. So embarrassing. And I, I missed work the next day. I called in sick because I woke up way too late. And, and uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a memorable time of being completely and utterly lost. <laughs> oh, my God. That's amazing. Like, are people in Japan, like better about that though like i think i heard something about like drunkenness is like it's socially completely socially acceptable and the way the way that people japanese people look after a drunk person it's really quite special but it's also you know it's it's, uh, western people are kind of freaked out by it because there's no stigma about being drunk in public or anything like that Um, so it's been quite quite lovely for me (laughs) you'd fit in here you would be you fit right in heather I 100% missed my opportunity. I could have come seen you in Japan and now you're going to be gone. Uh, if you're coming, I'll come back and meet you here. <laughs> yes. Okay. It's a date. I one to be lost is that, yeah, is also like literally lost. My mate and I, we're going to go to Bosnia, right? It, this was like 10, 11 years ago. Like it was before, it was like right before I moved here. Like um, on that trip, I met the guy who became my, my husband here and I don't know why we were going to Bosnia. I think because my dad had been there in the war and he said it was beautiful and I was just obsessed. I was like, I need to go to Bosnia. But at the time, you know, it was quite, like even now probably, quite separated from the Union. It's sort of like a bit hard to get there. It's not on the normal train paths, you know, things like this. So we had to get on a train to Serbia and then from Serbia get a bus that would take us to Bosnia and on the train there was a Serbian girl who was like okay this will be fine but you have to make sure you get on the blah bus say like blah a yes. okay do not for any reason in your life get on like the blah b bus because oh. you know it will not only take you to the wrong part of town where it'll be nighttime and you won't have any way to get around and you'll be stuck but also the people in that area, you know, legitimately trauma from the war will hate you. I was like, okay, blah, a bus, blah, a bus, you know, like we were like, definitely stuff happened. We saw a dead body. We were walking around, you know, some guy who said he was from Mexico. Dead body? Was this during the war? No, no. It was just a guy in the train station. Oh, just, it was just a guy in the train station. I think it was normal to know. Uh, but like some stuff happened, right? Random stuff. Like some guy who said he was from Mexico, who I don't think was actually from Mexico, tried to touch up my friend. It was a whole deal. Okay. So finally we get to the bus station. We're going to get on the bus and we're like, fuck, which was the bad one? <laughs> we could not, like, she was like, my friend Kathy was like convinced that it was this one. I was convinced that it was this one. In the no. end, we were just like, toss a coin. Okay. 50 50. We're going to end up in the right spot. And that's all we've got. You're probably way ahead of me on this. We ended up on the bad one. We ended up on the bad one. And like it was about three hours or whatever on this bus with people who hated us and wanted us dead. You know, not just because they don't like us, but because actual like military war trauma. Okay. Like legitimate reasons to hate us. And like we were like getting off at stops, like making sure that one of us had a literal foot on the bus. Do you know what I mean? So they couldn't leave us there. (laughs) uh, My friend wanted to drink from this like natural spring. And I was like, okay, you turn your back. I'll face them. (laughs) I got you. I got you covered like this. Oh my God. Just knowing that after that three hours was over, we were going to be in this place that we were just going to be lost as F. Like we couldn't meet up with the guy that we'd arranged to meet up with. We'd have no way of getting on a bus. We'd have to like we get there it's the dead of night it's like midnight everyone goes with their family off into their cozy houses or whatever and we just like attempted to find a payphone but like we were stuck in like a matrix we'd like go around we'd be like looking around like oh here's an indoor thing we'd go into a mall there's nothing there we'd come out you know and then we'd end up back at the bus station we're like that's weird thought we turned left this time you know and it was like it was like a like a parallel universe where everywhere we went ended us back at the bus station 
at the end, we did finally end up in the, like, uh, this guy was coming out of his house with his daughter. His dad was a taxi driver and he lived in, like, central Sarajevo, like, in the part that we wanted to go to. And he lived there. And he had just, like, come over in his taxi to see his son and his grandkids. And they were coming out of the house. And we obviously looked like, oh, we were very young and blonde and small and we're going to die there. You know, like, vultures were circling. They're like, that's so weird. Basically, he, he read us straight away and he's like, you've ended up in the wrong place, haven't you? And we're like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's like my dad's gonna take you back to Sarajevo. <laughs> like, thank God for that guy. Like, he did totally scam us and like charge us four times the amount. I don't even. I'm not. I ain't even mad at it. I ain't even mad. Well, and, and you live to tell the tale. That's true. And this is a good segue into number uh, eight, which is another random one. A memorable encounter with a stranger. And I think that you've already got your answer, but I, oh, I'm sure you have a, another one. Do you? You go, you go. And then I'll do my dude. He's worthy. Your, your story reminded me, and it's not nearly as scary or whatever is yours, but I did a, a student work abroad thing in London from Canada when I was 21. And then I had a one month Eurorail pass in Europe and I hadn't got nearly, this was like 19... 86, maybe, 87. It was before the wall came down. And I was young and I was gay and I was immature. In other words, I was exactly the way I am now. <laughs> and I didn't take enough money. I didn't save enough money. And I ran out of money in the first week. Oh, shit. So then I would just go into grocery. Like when I would travel somewhere, I had enough money for a hotel, but I didn't have enough money for food. So I would just buy like a can of pate and a loaf of bread and that's what I would live on <laughs> okay as you do as you do oh but and then and then I kept meeting people great young people and then I that were like I, in in uh, Germany I met a cute young Swedish boy he was totally straight and then I after we parted company about a week later I exchanged contact information and I phoned him and said can I come stay with you so that's how I survived but stayed with him, yeah. and stayed with another pair of brothers from Hamburg and so on. So then I was on my way back to London. And then it was, I'd had about 10 more days in London. There was one more paycheck waiting for me in London. So I would not be poor anymore once I got back to London. But I had to get there. And I was down to my last few <laughs> dollars. And I, but I had a Euro pass. So my transportation was covered. And then, you know, my, my, my last day in Europe, I realized, I find out that no, actually you have to pay for the crossing, whatever the channel crossing, the train. The like channel. That's not, that's oh, not, that was not included. And I absolutely did not have any money. <gasps> oh, fuck. So I mean, whatever the city or whatever it was, and I can't remember what country I was in, in Europe, just before that crossing, it must've been France. I don't know what it yeah, was. Yeah, France probably, yeah. And I was so desperate that I, I heard somebody speaking English <laughs> and I went up and it was an American woman and she was very nice. And I explained my situation. And I said, can I, and it was $30. It was like 30 bucks. That's all it was, but I didn't have it. Yeah. I said, can I please borrow $30 from you and I'll send it to you as soon as I get back to Canada. And she said, no, but you should just go to your embassy. Your embassy has to deal with you. So you should go to the Canadian embassy. So she gave me good advice, which I hadn't thought of. And I, uh, but I mean, that's how desperate I was. <laughs> I asked a perfect stranger. To yeah. Get dollars. And so I went to the Canadian embassy and they, yeah, they gave me the money and I could get on the thing and go back. And it's all, all tickety boo. <laughs> I can't believe that. A random kid comes up to me in tears saying he can't get home. He's coming with me. I'm a peace fair. I'm give him a sandwich. I can't believe that woman. Yes, how rude is that eh? <laughs> There you okay. go. That's my memorable encounter. Do you have another one to contribute? Okay, or? I do. But this is all I could think of. Like in Seattle, I think it was like, like you know, like back home, like back home in Seattle, like uh, maybe about 05, 06, like early 2000s, roughly. I think I was in like college or something stupid. I was like late for class. I was late for something. I was like trekking my ass up a hill, like Seattle's like this. Like, uh, like there was a fire once and like in the 19th century, wherever the fuck. And like, uh, instead of like clearing that shit away, they were like, shall we just put everything on top of it? I'll be fine. So like all the 
all the roads go like this. So I was like hauling my ass up one of these hills, like late trying to get somewhere. And like all of Seattle is covered in the summer months at all times by like roving bands of foreigners like this with like a person in the middle who's got like a, a stick with like a flag on, you know? Uh, and I think this was like probably Japanese actually, like a, a Japanese band of people all together. sort of like moving around with like a lady in the middle with like a Japanese flag. She's showing people Seattle. Everybody's I'm hauling my photos. ass up this, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like hauling my ass up this hill. Uh, this guy, he is like in the way, and I'm like, oh, sorry. And I like go left, and he goes left, and I'm like, oh, shit. And I go right, he goes right. We're like, we're like doing this awful thing, you know, like dancing in a row. And all of a sudden, I'm like tired of it. It's gone on way too long now, you know. Like I, I stand up all the way. I look him straight in the eyes, and he, he looks me straight like this. And he's got his camera, and he just goes like this, click. And then he just puts it down. And like, then we just stared at each other. I was like, ah. and then he just walked away. <laughs> That's fantastic. I saw, <laughs> I saw that photo. What? No, shove. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, watch it. It's in like some sort it of like, Kenji, like Tokyo. Kenji <laughs> it was Kenji. Kenji took the picture. <laughs> maybe like uh, the photo's called tragedy and i'm just like sweaty and like like cry like my mascara is like running a bit and i'm like like indignant like <laughs> fantastic i love that that is not that is a good one yeah oh god next with me it is number nine what did you want to be when you grew up if you've actually achieved that in real life what's it like to be fantastically stable like because i wouldn't know asking for a friend so my answer will be short because it's not very interesting. Uh, I was such a fire bug as a kid. My first dream was to be a fireman. Really? <laughs> that, that, and that's it. Yeah. And I grew out of it within about 10 minutes. But uh, that was my first. I, I wrote a story about it. I drew a picture about it. And I was such a fire bug. I almost burned my parents' farm down. Oh, my God. Really? I'm not a fire bug at all now. But I sure was as a kid. I loved lighting fires. And, yeah. Uh, so I, how, I, how much of the fire burned before it stopped? Not, not so much, but it, it was just touch and go that it spread. Yeah, It was the, um, we call it the tin, it's not a very imaginative name, but it was the place where we took all the tin cans and I had to take the, and we called it the tin can place. <laughs> just like my parents had a second farm. There was no houses, but there was granaries and a farmyard and we called it the other place. <laughs> So I was, as a, as a seven or eight, year, eight, eight or nine year old, probably, I was to take the cans up to the tin can place and I, I started a fire and it was dry grass and it spread and I ran and I, I was scared of my mom. So I ran to my grandma and I almost gave her poor grandma. She was about 75 at that time, a heart attack and she ran out and then she called mom and they backed the water truck up and spread, got it down and boy, I was in trouble. <laughs> So, yes, it could have been worse, but it was scary enough that I was in big trouble. Heather, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> okay, when I was a kid, I legit wanted to be this, like, FBI agent. Do you know what I mean? But, like, glamorous and, like, lethal. Okay, like, I had in my mind, I was just going to be this effing, like, hot as F badass, like, in the FBI, and I was going to get all these baddies I don't know it lasted forever I wanted to be that until I was at like at least high school or middle school maybe and so uh the second part of this prompt what's it like to be a fantastically stable adult to realize your dream <laughs> I have no idea I have no idea like I I put that in there because I like sometimes I ask my friends you know like what did you want to be you know and they're like oh I wanted to be an accountant and they are currently an accountant. Yeah, I'm mean? so curious to see if there's anybody that's going to answer and say <laughs> a dream, a childhood dream, and they actually became that. I know. Like, it's, it. not, it's not too late. You're only about, what are you, 22 or something? You, you could still become an FBI glam. Of glam. course. Uh, except for, you know, I'm afraid of the dark um, and guns and police. The last prompt in this tag, number 10. Another, the last tag is also random. Are you a people watcher? And a related question, do you have good peripheral hearing? Share an anecdote or three. Take it away. Um, people watcher, yeah, and peripheral listener. Yeah, I like to do that. 
it is a good it's a good hobby of mine like sometimes I like to write them down you know like in my notebook like my like journal or whatever for each year probably has like loads of them in because my life isn't exciting enough I've got to like fill in other people's lives but I think my best people watching experience was probably with my mate in Belgrade like we were just sitting like waiting for the train or something stupid we're like eating pastries just minding our own ass business right Right. so this car it just drives up it's tiny it's like this big it's approximately the size of a toy car it drives up and about nine thousand huge burly dudes get out it's like a clown car it's like mary poppins handbag it's like it just keeps coughing up like a nervous like muscly dudes and you're like surely there's no one else in there just like pop out another one like that we're like holy shit what's going on here they're like getting out with urgency right they're like like being birthed again popping out of this car um and they're sort of looking around you know they see us you know they they move over they're not interested in us they're looking around they see the skinny dude walking by eating a sandwich and they're like that's our dude they grab his arms and they're like talking in his ear they've got his arm they got his arm like quite tight you know like they're not like having a chat with this guy they're like you know it got him tight and they're chatting in his ear and then now there's two guys they've like both got him in a clamp and they're moving him toward the magic car and they push him in the magic car and then they all get in and like all of them as well have these like really girly handbags you know like like if you think like you know yeah a normal handbag like over the side like this like a tiny one you know that would just hold your lipstick like they've all got one and I was like telling it to my dad you know I was like basically we saw a guy get kidnapped by clowns wearing girls handbags and he's like no babes that's their gun like my dad he's worldly wise he knows the shit that's where they keep their their heat they're packing it in these girls bags on their backs like this and they just basically popped out of this car like magic grabbed this dude that owns the money, pulled him back into the magic space and sped off. Wow, your your Mm -hmm. dad is more than just a ball-popping pretty face. (laughs) He's more than a loose testicle, babe. He's smart. He knows stuff. (laughs) Wow, that's an amazing story. (laughs) I thought, at the midway point of this story, I thought this was going to be like a, a group of drag queens kidnapping pretty boys or something i wasn't sure oh where my they- god that'd be amazing wouldn't it if they had dresses on or something and glitter what about you I'm, I'm definitely a people watcher and i stick out like a sore thumb in japan because it is taboo in japan people don't watch people uh-huh. like eye contact with strangers is verboten i don't know why i'm using german words to talk about japanese culture but we'll just go with it and i, I literally don't care I, I don't stare, but I almost stare, and people don't like it. But also because they don't look at anybody, they don't really know that I'm looking at them. Yeah. And I've seen so many amazing things. So peripheral hearing is kind of lost on me because I don't understand the language well enough to hear. But I, you know, I can I pick up a, a little bit. But I, I just to share one or two stories. I remember. A lot of these, most of them have been on the train because that's where you're packed like sardines into with a whole bunch of Japanese people. I remember once in the morning on my way to work, two young Japanese women who were not together. They were obviously strangers to one another and crowded train. Everybody's packed like sardines. And Japanese people socially are the, uh, the politest people on earth. But in an impersonal setting, they are... I would say the rudest people on earth. So if there's no social connection, oh my God. So these two young Japanese women, they were back to back. And one of them, her hair was not as long and glorious as yours, but it was, you know, at least shoulder length. And she would just be kind of flicking it and it would touch the back of the other young woman's head. And so the other young woman started "Mm." And then so she would do it more. And, and I, I thought they were really comfortable. So it was just this huge altercation. <laughs> and I was watching. I, was, I mean, because I was, my face was stuck almost in between their heads. And they were doing all this. And they were. <laughs> so that, that's, it. that's one example. Some, some of them are, have been more touching. Like I remember a young Japanese man alone on a train at night. And it was, I don't know whether his girlfriend had dumped him. I have no idea what the situation was, but tears started 
rolling down his cheeks. And he took off his suit jacket and opened it so that the inner lining was out and wiped his face off with the inner lining of the jacket and then put his jacket on and, and then went out about it. Then the train moved on and he went home. And it was just like, I can't believe I saw that. But nobody else on the train saw it. But because I, nobody else looks at anybody else. So it, the, the gamut of, of the things that I've seen in Japan, and I, you know, I've seen lots of things in Canada too, but everybody stares at everybody in Canada. But yeah, the two, two bookend examples of, of the kinds of things, that, because I'm a, yeah. definitely a people watcher. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that, about like, yeah, in Japan, they don't look at each other and they don't stare. They must probably feel like every moment is a private moment because they won't be watched. That's right. Shit. Like I was thinking, like, uh, when I went to India, it was, like, the exact opposite of this. Like, everyone in India is, like, very cool with just being very obvious about being all up in your business. Like, so we must basically be the India for Japanese people. Like, we're just like... That's right. (laughs) That is exactly right. So that is the Soggy Expat Book Maniac Tag. And we did not... Did you make a list of people to tag? No. Okay, so we'll do that after. Uh, we are both going to tag a whole bunch of people. Please check the show notes for who we tag. And Heather, what a great collaboration. That was amazing. What oh, that's fab. Do? What are we going to do tomorrow? I don't know if I have the balls to do another collab with you. Did you see what I did there? 